I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest, and my guest today is Professor Robert Legbold of Columbia University, former head of the Harriman Institute, and the author of a new book, Return to Cold War, not the Cold War, but to Cold War. Bob, why did you pick that title? Because I think the qualitative change for the worse in U.S.-Russia relations, that is everything that's happened in the context of the Ukrainian crisis that has transformed a relationship for much of the post-Cold War period that was more ambiguous, neither friend nor foe, but we could hope on each side more friend than foe, has now clarified as an adversarial relationship. And more than that, as an adversarial relationship, it is profoundly so. As I said, qualitatively different from before. And I was trying to capture or understand what we mean when we say qualitatively different. It's obviously not the same as the original Cold War. There are fundamental differences between what we have today and what we had for much of the 50 years after World War II. But it does have a number of qualities that are like the original Cold War. And alas, like the early phases of the Cold War, from, say, the Berlin blockade in 1948 until after, shortly after Stalin's death in 1953. And only if we understand how deep this is and why the qualities that I see like the Cold War capture what's happened at this point will we begin to understand what the potential costs are of where we are, what the consequences are. Instead, our focus is much too narrow. It's much on the immediate set of issues, the challenge, the other side, Russia poses for the U.S. and the West, the United States and NATO for Russia, and the response in that context is as narrow, it's basically tactical, without thinking of the larger stakes that we have and what the impact of this will be if it continues for years, as it is now slated to do. When Ronald Reagan visited Moscow towards the end of his presidency, he was asked, is the Cold War over? He said, of course, and then he added, that was a different time. How did we slide back into a Cold War? One of the big debates in the American historical profession and among political scientists during the Cold War was, was it the Soviet Union that had launched the Cold War? Was it then there was an argument that it was the United States? And then we got the argument that both sides were culpable. What is your interpretation today? for round two. Two questions. How did we get to a new Cold War? And what, were, what was the nature of the origins of the original Cold War? On the second question, briefly, um, it probably was uh, fated to be. Uh, after all, two major powers uh, left over in the ruins of World War II, standing astride the wreckage from that war in Europe and elsewhere. Both of them with political, each of them with a political and economic system that was fundamentally different from the other and juxtaposed. Uh, and in a context where the United States and the Soviet Union were now prepared to exercise or uh, act more broadly, geographically, strategically than they ever had before, uh, it was probably almost inevitable that you would then have a clash. The real question for me in studying that earlier period and much of the Cold War Yes, there was a logic to the Cold War. There probably inevitably was going to be a Cold War, but did it have to be as deep? Did it have to be as universal? Did it have to be as militarized as it was? That's a separate question. On, on your first question, how did we get to where we are? Uh, as I say, the relationship is now qualitatively different, in my view, from what it was even five years ago, or three years ago, if you will, certainly at the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the post-Cold War period. Uh, and that, that qualitative change is because we've been pushed over the cliff in the context of the Ukrainian crisis. My view is that the Russians bear primary responsibility for that because of their actions in Crimea and Donbass war. The harder problem is to explain why those Russian actions occurred and where does the EU, NATO, the United States bear some role in the evolution that led Russia to do what it did that pushed us over the cliff. And therefore, to begin answering your question, I believe that we got to where we are now, even though where we got to now is because of going over the cliff, as a series of stages that we didn't recognize for much of the 20 years of the post-Cold War period. 
we got here through phases. Our impression, I think most, both analysts on the Russian side, policymakers on the Russian side, same thing in the US and in Europe, that we've had ups and downs throughout that 20 year period of time. Uh, and it's been the axis of the ups and downs in the relationship has been essentially horizontal. That's not the case. The ups and downs have essentially been on a downward axis. In the amplitude of the axes, the ups and then the downs, whether it's at the beginning, the hopes in the Bush senior and Clinton administration years, and then the downs around NATO enlargement, and then the slight up, and then the down over the Kosovo War, uh, and then the slight up in the early part of the, the Bush junior administration after 9-11 and cooperation, and then down after the rush to war in Iraq and continuing down until the Georgian intervention in in uh, Georgia, until the Russian intervention in Georgia in 2008, preceded by that harsh speech by Putin, President Putin in Munich Security, Munich Security, Security Conference 2007, then the reset and so on. So the image is one of ups and downs. What we fail to recognize is going back to at least the Clinton administration, there were, each was a phase, each phase had its opportunities and some successes and certainly hopes. But within each phase, there were malignant seeds that, that, in fact, at each next phase were larger and more malignant. And they continued to build around a series of issues until they culminated in Ukraine. After all, Ukraine is related to that phase and that malignant, that malignant uh, seed in the Bush administration around color revolutions. And that, that, smaller, more mal that, that malignant smaller seed in the Clinton administration was over the jealousy that the Russians already showed over a role that the United States would play within the post-Soviet space, even before NATO enlargement, around partnership for peace and things of this kind. We didn't understand the way in which those phases, uh, as I say, were infused with these malignant seeds. And therefore, we didn't, on either side, either Russia or the United States, do enough in order to protect them. That's, that's the reason for the ups and downs. That's the reason for an answer to an important question that we didn't face. Why did this relationship, why was this relationship never able to deal with the boom and bust character? Why could it never, given what had ended with the end of the Cold War, why could it not have gained traction so that you could build on success and move from progress to progress? You alluded earlier to the militarization of the Cold War that took place and that really took off with the Korean War and the Truman administration's response with NSC 68, mm -hmm. which was driven by Paul Nitze and his, uh, I suppose, ideological opposite by that time was George F. Kennan, who felt that the conflict had become, was becoming grossly militarized and that it was a recipe for another World War I, which is what I think Kennan feared, that each side starts to escalate and that arms races lead to major wars. Now in the Cold War, we did manage to establish some degree of cooperation with Moscow arms control treaties and other measures to avoid a military confrontation. But from what I see today, it looks like we're, and from what you read in the newspapers, it looks like we're going in the opposite direction, that people in the arms control community are concerned that the progress that was made during the Cold War is now steadily being eroded. How do you see that? Good question. And in terms of the premises that underlie it, you're dead right. Uh, but if you go back to the history of it, the Cold War, yes, the, the relationship, the Cold War became uh, heavily militarized and from Kennan's point of view too militarized and he was saying it right at the beginning, he was an opponent of uh, the creation of NATO itself. Uh, and, uh, and he and, and Paul Nitze certainly did see things differently in terms of the Soviet threat. But over the years, uh, we did begin to manage the risks of military conflict, particularly coming out of the Berlin crisis, where it could lead, since we were now nuclear powers, both of us, uh, with that kind of escalation. The point I would make, and I hope it's not uh, insight into what's necessary or what could happen these days, the rules that were created, including beginning to negotiate arms control, the SALT agreement and the like, 
uh, or other areas of, of restraint in the relationship were not the product of deliberation where the two sides sat down and said, what should we do? They were the products of crises that drove them in the direction of creating it. We began to get rules, not because we, we were addressing the question, the problem. We got, began to get rules because of a Cuban Missile Crisis. And one hopes that, as many people comment today, the rules are gone. We're not quite sure what the rules are in the present context, that that's not the only way that we can begin reconstituting rules. Now, the second part of, uh, I believe, the answer to your question is that, sadly, in the context of this post-Cold War period, rather than, again, building on success, success built on success, and especially in the present context, we're moving in the opposite direction. For whatever set of reasons, one of the major benefits, maybe accomplishments, of the post-Cold War period was e the demilitarization of what had been the standoff in Central Europe at the Elba between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. A large part of that was the collapse of one alliance, and in the case of, that is the Warsaw Pact, in the case of NATO, uh, a shifting mission. Uh, which was going to be out of area by and large, and in any event no longer focused on a, on a Soviet, now post-Soviet Russian threat that, that evoked Article 5 and a need to maintain uh, a girded military and the rest. Some of it also was supported by the effort to move in the direction of formally institutionalizing the demilitarization, that is the arms control agreements the conventional arms control agreement in Europe, including the adapted phase, and then that faded, that folded, that failed. And that, that process is now moribund. But the significant end of this story is that now, sadly, we're moving in the opposite direction. And rather than the benefit or the accomplishment of demilitarizing the European thing, enough so that people in Europe, even though they hadn't built the European security system they meant, they felt fairly secure about European security. That wasn't the unstable area in the world. Suddenly there is an instability, and behind it, or in addressing it, each side is in the process of remilitarizing a new central front. It's been moved to the east. It's no longer at the Elba. It's now on the other side. It's at the Boob. Uh, and it is one of the manifestations, I think one of the consequences, one of the sad consequences of what I call this new Cold War. Let's talk about Mr. Putin. For a second. Yeah, a few months ago, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton likened Putin's march into Crimea to Hitler's takeover of the Sudetenland in 1938. Do you see Putin in that vein as an ideological leader in the, in the uh, totalitarian mold seeking to expand Russia's territory as far as possible, or do you think that he is more in more of a realist, a more cautious leader who seeks his opportunities where he can and does not fit into this mold that many in the United States are trying to fit him into? Well, the notion that Putin is Hitler and what happened in Crimea is the equivalent of Hitler's uh, aggression in Sudetenland is uh, doubly unfortunate. Uh, it's unfortunate because it's fundamentally wrong. And then you combine that with the degree to which it's uh, derisive uh, and has the effect of a derisive uh, characterization on the other side in Russia makes it, I think, counterproductive uh, and unfortunate. Uh, I do believe that what the Russians did in Crimea violated international norms, and I think it's a serious matter that a major power grabs a piece of territory, an important portion of another country's territory, uh, not only that it does that, but it does so contravening a guarantee of sovereignty that it itself had given in the Budapest, Budapest Agreement in 94 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. So that's a serious matter. Uh, that is not the same thing as saying uh, that it is a kind of pre-planned aggression which grows out of an imperial urge that Putin is leading. I think, I think as we know more about the events of Crimea, uh, again, without excusing the way, the way in which they played out, uh, it's, in my mind, it is evident that they were event-driven. The decision to do what they did with the little green men in Crimea were taken in the, the uh, 
uh, 24 hours after the February 21st agreement that the Polish, French, and German foreign ministers had worked out with Yanukovych, and Yanukovych fled, and then you got this alternative government. Within that period of time, Putin, Putin himself, took the decision to seize control within Crimea. But even the decision then to annex Crimea, I think, waited until uh, further developments, event-driven, including the sense that they were going to lose their strategic position entirely within Crimea. Again, that's not to excuse it or, or even rationalize it, but it's a very different thing from assuming that this was sort of part of a blueprint or a plan for how, how, uh, how uh, the Soviet Union was going to create uh, Hitler's Lebensraum. Um, let's conclude with a look at Russia's domestic situation, and in particular, Russia seems to be very disappointed in this past day that the, Saudi, the Saudis have refused to freeze oil production. And it appears, I was reading from Russian officials, senior Russian officials, that they are anticipating that oil prices will remain low through at least mid-2017. Needless to say, Russia has been running very rapidly through its reserve funds. What is your analysis of the impact of continued low oil prices on Russia's internal stability? Well, in the short run, I think their mentality still is we can tough it out. Uh, but they are increasingly aware of uh, realities, including the one that you noted, uh, that the stabilization funds, if they rely heavily on that, will be exhausted by the end of 2017 if oil is below $40 a barrel, as it's likely to be through that period. Secondly, I think they now recognize that the minuscule positive growth that they had anticipated in the economy by the end of this year or at the latest early next year is probably not going to occur, which means further negative growth, which means further decline with the inflation given the ruble dollar exchange rate, uh, increased inflation, and, uh, and diminished economic dynamism of a decline in the real wage for the average Russian, which is where you begin to get political pressure, uh, presumably, or political trouble. But I think for the moment, there's still, some people say that the strategy in Russia is waiting for oil prices to go up. I think they still had been hoping for that. Increasingly, I think they're being realistic about it. Uh, as I said, if the hope is that now maybe it's postponed, maybe it won't be till the end of 2016 that you see positive growth, I think they'll continue to behave the way they are. They'll be able to do so because the streets will not be mobilized in that period of time. In my view, you can always be wrong in this, in this circumstance. The question is how soon, uh, how soon the impact, if things don't change, oil remains very low in the $30 a barrel range. Uh, and the international economy, markets, credit access for the Russians is as it is, this does become a problem that they have not managed and it begins to have consequences. How soon it will be in terms of popular unrest, I'm not sure. My guess is in the nature of the Russian system, the unrest that would matter more to them will be at the elite level, the clan level, regional leaders and the rest. I think it probably won't be at the earliest stages, the streets. It may begin to show up, as it did in the Soviet period, in the Gorbachev years, with worker unrest in various locales. And there's already been some sign of that because of the impact of this negative uh, economic picture where people, the unemployment rates are not yet high, but what I would call the disguised unemployment rates are going up. That is, people whose hours are being cut back uh, and, uh, as a result, who are very worried about the economic picture. But for the moment, I think their basic approach is uh, we can tough it out. Well, just as a final, final, revolutions or upheaval in Russian history seems to have quite unpredictable consequences. Could this be a case of be careful of what you wish for for those in the West who are adamantly opposed to Putin's regime? Two things, uh, including the answer, my response to your question. The first is, uh, anyone who's as old as I am, or even as old as you are, uh, and have lived through events since 1985 would be very careful about predicting what can and can't happen. Some very dramatic things that none of my community of people, students of the Soviet Union, expected happened. 
so I don't want to, I'll answer your questions, but I'm not going to put any part of my retirement account on the answers that I give you. Uh, on, your, on your question about uh, being careful about what you wish for, first thing I would say is that I think Russia, historically this has been true, it's true of other countries as well, Russia is stable until it isn't. Uh, secondly, if Russia becomes unstable in some fairly basic way with real discontinuity, what's likely to happen? If people believe, and indeed are in the West organizing or supporting policies in the hopes that we can bring it down, bring the regime down, they ought to be thinking about what would be the consequences implicit in your question. I don't think it means we then get a new Gorbachev or a new Yeltsin. Uh, in addition to the instability and the potential problem of instability in a country of that size, in the location that it has in the midst of what more broadly is not a stable region, to say the least, those consequences alone, instability would be great. But in terms of the nature of the regime that would likely come to power, the way things exist within Russia today, it's certainly not going to be better than the current regime as it's constituted. And I think there's a very good chance that it could be worse. That is more crudely nationalistic, uh, more crudely insular, or at least anti-Western than it is at this point. So uh, one would hope what we have in front of us is the prospect of constructive change within Russia. The United States and all of our leaderships through Republican and Democratic administrations say we want a dynamic Russia uh, incorporated into a global economy, contributing to it and benefiting from it, and that's the kind of relationship we want to build. I think that still should be the fundamental objective of U.S. policy. And one would hope in terms of this topic, return to Cold War, that both leaderships, because it has to be both Russia and the U.S. and our Western allies, believe that it's very important that we not merely deal with Ukraine or Syria or ISIS, but that we deal with those problems in a way where we're beginning to short circuit, move away from the new Cold War, because we recognize what the consequences of that will be over the next 10 years. Professor Legvold, I'd like to thank you for your incisive answers. My pleasure.